So let's all stand together and start singing with angels from the realms of glory. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect or complete. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. <clears throat> For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sins thou wouldest not, Neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. 
He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for who you are. And as we think of the Christmas season and watching nativity scenes and even little plays, uh, we pray that we would remember the real reason why Christmas is here. The real reason is, is you joined the human race to become that perfect mediator between God and man. And we want to thank you for that. We thank you that not only were you willing to join the human race, but you were willing to die and pay the penalty for sin that each of us owe. A penalty that we could never pay. You paid on the cross for us. We thank you. We thank you that in your love towards us, you're willing to give to us the free gift of eternal life. We thank you uh, for that. We want to uh, just commit our nation to you this morning. And as we think of our leaders and, and even the transition that is uh, going on, uh, we just pray that in your grace, you could undertake for our country. And we, we thank you for it. We thank you for the freedoms that we have to even gather like this without fear. And so we just pray that that would continue. And we pray that as responsible citizens, that we would use our liberty wisely, primarily to demonstrate the very grace of God that saves us. And so we we thank you for every opportunity. We want to commit our service to you this morning. We thank you for the children, and we just pray that uh, they would not just do a good job, but they would enjoy doing and ministering in this way. And so we thank you uh, for this this morning. And we want to uh, just remember those who are are sick and we know are hurt. Uh, We know that there are some whose names aren't in the bulletin, but let's, uh, let's remember to uphold each other in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to tell you the story about Jesus' birth. God did many miracles when he sent his son to be born. We are going to do our best to tell it to you with a little help from some others. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with a child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger.
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them.
And this next part of our story is when the wise men come to see Jesus, King of the Jews, which takes place a while after Jesus was born, maybe one and a half years later. We have no way of knowing this, but he'd probably been able to walk by then. Hmm, that sure messes up our nativity we set up every year if the wise men weren't there. Maybe I should just put the wise men out in June. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, go, and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me, so that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Isn't it amazing how since the creation, God had a plan. He sent his son to be our savior, to be a perfect sacrifice for our sins, so that our sins be washed away. It's wonderful news, and we only need to believe in him, that his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave finished the payment for our sin, so that we can be saved. We can be like the good shepherds and tell everybody the good news of salvation.
Well, as we think of Christmas and, and programs like this, the uh, question that could be asked, I'll ask it, why did Jesus have to be born into the human race? Couldn't he have, as God, provide salvation in any other way? And you might think, well, if he's God, he could certainly do whatever he wanted. But God sent his son to this earth. And what we read in the scripture, and I'd like to look at uh, four passages. And the first one is in John chapter 1, where we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It's kind of interesting that the Bible connects the Word of God with God Himself. And so I might just say this. If you want to learn about God, you have to go to the Word of God to learn about God. And uh, that's a a very important point. Um, We can look at His handiwork. We can see creation. And we can marvel at how great our God must be. But if you really want to know about the character of God, you must go to the Word of God. Well, it goes on to say, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so... the the pronouns change in here and it becomes very personal. Uh, And this light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And in verse 14, we read, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And later in this same chapter, it says this, that it was His Son, Jesus Christ, that reveals God. Well, as we think of uh, Jesus Christ becoming flesh and dwelling among us, in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, we read this about Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 6, who in reference Christ Jesus, the end of verse 5, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so we have Jesus Christ, who this verse says, had every right to call himself God, had every right to stay in heaven. Uh, He was equal with God. But, and there is that little conjunction of contrast What did Jesus do? He made himself of no reputation. And when we read, he made himself of no reputation, the first thing that is mentioned is not his death on the cross, but his coming and joining the human race. And he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And it's interesting, if we were to look at the Jewish history, we would find that they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a king. They were looking for someone to ride in on a, on a white horse and to rescue them from the Romans and to establish this glorious kingdom. But he didn't come that way. He came very humbly. And he came as a servant. He didn't come with a big reputation. Uh, he was, uh, didn't come in very presidential. And if you were voting for a president, you probably wouldn't vote for Jesus at this particular time. And that's why the Jewish nation missed their Messiah. But it doesn't end there. It goes on to say, And being found in fashion as a man... He humbled himself. And so this servant humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And as we stop and we think of the death of Jesus Christ and the kind of death that he died, 
the phrase or this verse ends with this phrase even the death of the cross dying on a cross was a very humiliating thing uh, literally it took hours for people to die on a cross and there's record that people have hung for a day or two on a cross and they were naked and everyone could see them it was a very disgraceful thing and yet Jesus Christ was willing to do that. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed. Uh, and He prayed, Oh Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from Me. But then He added, But it's not My will. It's Thy will be done. And so Jesus Christ was willing to go to the cross. Uh, we also... Uh, see in 1 Timothy chapter 2 where Jesus Christ is made reference as the perfect God-man. Let's listen to what it has to say. The Apostle Paul first exhorts us to pray for and give thanks for everything and for all men. And then in verse 2 he says, pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And as we stop and we think of, of the significance of this verse, a mediator to bring two parties together need to be equal with both parties. And in Job, Job asked the question, is there a mediator? Is there someone who can take God by the hand and me by the hand and bring us together? He asked that question, but it's never answered in Job. And we come to 1 Timothy chapter 2 in the verse we just read. And it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Listen, Jesus Christ was 100% human. And at the same time, He was 100% God. It wasn't a 50-50 deal. Theologians call that the hypostatic union of God and Christ. And what that means is this, is that Jesus Christ becomes the perfect mediator. And it's through Jesus Christ that God comes to us, and it's through Jesus Christ that we come to God. We need Jesus Christ. He is that mediator between God and man. And then in our scripture reading this morning, we looked at Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews chapter 10, the, uh, the author of that particular book uh, had this to say uh, to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people were very proud of their religion. They were very proud of their heritage and uh, just their history, and it was a big deal if you could trace your lineage back to Abraham. In fact, they thought that because they were of Abraham, they were fixed up forever. And in the Jewish religion, they sacrificed animals. And as we think of the sacrifice of animals, uh, the book of Hebrews explains to us that the blood of animals could never take away sin. And that's why they always had to bring a sacrifice. And every year they had the Passover. Every year they had the Day of Atonement. And there were many sheep that were sacrificed during this time. Now, we might ask the question, why, if the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, why 
did they have so many sacrifices? And why don't we do a sacrifice today? Well, this passage explains why. So let me uh, just t get, tell you the answer to that question. The Old Testament was an object lesson for all of us. And what it teaches us is this, and what it should have taught the children of Israel is that they cannot take care of their own sin problem. What they need is a substitute. So if you could imagine, I sin, an innocent animal dies. You sin, an innocent animal dies. Does that seem fair? The poor innocent animal. But he died, and what the priest did ceremonially is he laid his hand on the sinner and he laid his hand on the lamb and it pictured transferring the sinner's sin to this substitute and the substitute died in his place. What an object lesson. Year after year after year. And what should we learn from that? Today we learn that it's not by our good works that we pay for our sin. It's not by what we can do that will provide salvation. We need a substitute. And in John chapter 1, I won't turn back there, but in verse 29, it says this. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and it's at the time of his baptism. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ became that final sacrifice. And in our reading this morning, we read this, that God was not satisfied with sacrifices that were offered year after year. And if a sacrifice worked, if our good works worked, uh, we should be able to do one work and we'd be fixed up forever. But we're not, are we? We have to keep going over and over and over again. And so, what the passage goes on to say is what God did is He prepared a body. And that's what Christmas is really all about. He says, um, in verse uh, 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein which are of offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. O God, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering uh, oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Oh, that's why we don't need to bring a lamb to church or anywhere else and kill the lamb for our salvation. Because Jesus Christ was the lamb of God and he was perfect. And he paid for our sin. For how long? Forever. He only had to die once. The perfect sacrifice. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant 
that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The author of Hebrews elsewhere says this, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And the Jewish people needed to understand that it was Jesus Christ who came, who was that perfect mediator between God and man, who became the final sacrifice for sin. And as we heard the children say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his son. We celebrated at Christmas time. But why did he come? He came to become our next of kin. Did you realize that in the line of Jesus Christ, there are sinful Gentiles in his line? Uh, Jews don't really talk about that too much, but there was Rahab the harlot. Uh, there were others that uh, just didn't quite fit the line. But you know what that means to us? That means that Jesus Christ isn't, wasn't just born to save Jews, but the good news message is he was born to provide salvation and bring light to Gentiles. My guess is that most of us in this room, if not all of us, are Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I don't think too many of you are Jews either. But you know what? The good news is this. Jesus didn't come just to save his own people. He came to save everyone, anyone. And that's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and you know what? You know who the whosoever is? It's me. It's you. It's whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so as we think of the Christmas story, and, uh, and weren't the kids cute? <laughs> okay. And as they go through the story, let's not forget that behind that story, there is an everlasting truth that that babe that was born and laid in a manger grew up to be a sacrifice for sin, grew up to be the Savior of the world. And as John 3.16 tells us, whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So let me ask you this question. What are you trusting in for your eternal salvation? And what you're trusting in makes all the difference in the world. If you're trusting in your church, if you're trusting in the fact that you got up this morning and you came and watched children perform a Christmas uh, play, um, you're trusting the wrong object. Listen, you can go to every church in town uh, several times a week, and there's no place in the Scripture where it says that saves you. But there is in the Scripture. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we need to trust and put our confidence, our faith, in what He has done, the finished work on the cross. You might ask the question, well, if you don't need church to save, what are you doing? And my answer is this. Yet we need some place to go so we can learn we don't have to go to that place. So come to church and we'll learn you don't need church to get saved. You need the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted Him, if you're not sure that when you die, you will have a home in heaven that will last forever. I want you to know that the same author that wrote John 3.16 in his first epistle in chapter 5 says this, 
to everyone who believes, you can know you have eternal life. And you know why you can know? Because it is written in His Word. And His Word was with God, and it was God. Listen, we can trust the Bible. The Bible is our foundation. The Bible tells us that this word will last and stand forever. That's good news. And in the crazy world we live in today, and, and I don't think it's just me who thinks we live in a crazy world. In this crazy world, we need a foundation. We need something that is solid. We need something that is unchangeable that we can stake our eternal destiny on. And that is the written Word of God. And so when you think of a nativity scene, uh, I don't want to wreck your Christmas or anything like this, but I'll ask you, every time you look at a babe in a manger, why don't you remember that you know what? That babe represents the Word of God which lasts forever. And that babe is the one who is going to save us from our sin. It's very significant that when John the Baptist said, Behold, take a good look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have you looked at that Lamb? You can have life by beholding that Lamb of God. Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We thank you that we can trust it. And we pray that we wouldn't get cynical and we wouldn't uh, just take the viewpoint that, oh, there's good things in the Bible, but you can't believe everything. We pray that we would come to an understanding by faith, that the Word of God is indeed the Word of God. And we can bank and count on every word. We thank you that it's in the Bible that we learn of the Christmas story. We learn of how it happened, but most importantly, we learned why it happened. So we thank you for this. We thank you for our children. We thank you for uh, the songs they sang and and the fun that they had in, in uh, performing this little play. We thank you for this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand together and we'll close with the last verse of A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Hark the Herald Angels. All right. I'd like to thank you for coming and just remind you it's never ever what we can do for God but always and forever what he has done for us and again what did he do for us he sent his son to die and pay the penalty for sin and because of that we can be saved so thank you for coming and Merry Christmas have a good day you're dismissed